I was going to sit, but now I think I'll stand. Uh, I want to thank Professor Bree Sherwin for moderating this. I want to thank everybody that took part in putting it together. I think this is such an important discussion that we're having. And the topic I want to give is actually a little bit unconventional. I don't want to talk about making the murder per se, but I want to try to locate it within a broader discussion that I've seen going on, especially on social media. Now, Professor Pearl talked about at the beginning of her um, presentation, these are things, some of the things we've seen are things that people don't want to believe exists. But I want to take it a step further and talk about an instance where maybe there are people who know it exists that are trying to convince other people that it doesn't exist. So the topic of my uh, discussion is, but did you hear making sense of efforts to discredit making a murder? Now, so making a murder premiered on Netflix on December 18th, 2015. And for us, that was fortunate because we were about to go into a major snowstorm. Everybody was stuck at home and we could bench watch this show. And needless to say, the show went viral nationally, perhaps worldwide. Very quickly, there was a Making a Murderer subreddit that showed up that was very heavily trafficked. And then you saw it frequently discussed on Facebook, on Twitter, and other types of social media. In fact, we even had a We the People um, petition for the president to try to get a pardon of Stephen Avery. We also had something on change.org, and you can see they've actually stopped the number of petitioners that, that, you can, that can be put on here, but the bottom one has 491,000 supporters at this time. Now, these have been responded to. That's why they've been stopped, but it was averaging about 100,000 signatures a week. So needless to say, it really did go viral. In fact, it came to the attention all the way to the top of our country where the President of the United States issued an official response. And it's my understanding this is one of the only times he's ever done so. Of course, the response was not positive for Stephen Avery. It says, however, the President cannot pardon a state criminal offense. Okay? The law prevents him from pardoning Stephen Avery. In fact, I was even involved in this viral process, very minimally, <laughs> on December 27th. This is what I wrote to all my Facebook friends, and perhaps I got a couple people to get interested in it. And I still feel this exact same way today. Okay? That's December 27th. But I'll tell you that shortly thereafter, maybe early to mid-January, I started seeing a shift in the conversation about this series. And this is an example, again, from my Facebook feed. It's someone I've blocked out their name, but this is someone that's a former prosecutor that I worked at at Travis County Attorney's Office. And this is what she said. She says, I haven't watched Making a Murderer yet, but I was considering it, but then I read this article. What's going on? Okay? And she links an article with the title, Evidence Making a Murderer Left Out, that'll totally change your opinion of the case. I started seeing this all over the place. In fact, this would be a very common response that was on her very wall. That's what I heard on CNN. They left a ton of evidence out. It's a one-sided show to make you think he's innocent, totally a bunch of crap. I wouldn't watch it. <laughs> so my question is, what is going on here? Okay? What is this evidence that everyone's talking about? So if I click on the link to that very Ranker article, what they have, and I'll switch back, they have 16 pieces of evidence that the documentary filmmakers allegedly omitted purposefully. Okay? And we're not going to go through all of all these, by the way. I would love to if we had time. But it mentions um, a lot of different things. And if you've read any of these articles, I'm going to tell you that it's the exact same things in every article usually grouped between 9 and 16 items, usually worded in exactly the same language. And we're going to talk about perhaps why that is. But uh, one of the ones that we are going to talk about a little bit is this DNA was found on the hood of Teresa Hallback's car. But there's a lot of these things here, and I know you're reading it. I'm going to go ahead and switch and give you an opportunity to just glance at a few of these other things. And you're going to see, I think they fall into a few different categories, and I'll tell you what they are in just a second. But so I'm reading this article, and so you start to think, what's the obvious question that oddly a lot of people aren't asking, which is what is the source of all of these things? I mean, we've got 10 hours of footage on making a murderer 
And all of a sudden you get these articles that just list a bunch of things between 9 and 16. And everybody's saying, well, obviously this show is junk, right? Well, let's vet these sources a little bit. So actually this particular article has sources at the bottom. And I've quoted what I think are some of the pertinent parts. And I think when you start to look a little bit deeper, you see some recurring themes. Okay? You see a name come up frequently, Ken Kratz. Everyone here knows who Ken Kratz is. Right? He was the elected DA. He was the head prosecutor in the Stephen Avery case. And he sat second chair in the Brendan Dassey trial. Now, you see some that are citations to other news articles. Believe me, when you read those news articles, there's another, the same name keeps coming up, okay? So what we've got here is kind of an echo chamber. Here's the sources on the other ones, okay? Really, really similar themes coming up. Okay, so I start to think, well, how does this whole thing get started? And one of the things I love about the internet, there's a lot of things to love, there's also some bad things, but one of the great things is you can kind of date events in a very, very precise way on the internet. So I start looking and searching, I go to the subreddit, I go to different places. What is the earliest mention of these alleged omissions from the show? Okay, Where's the earliest thing you can find on the entire internet? And in fact, it is an email from December 25th, Christmas Day, from Ken Kratz Law Firm, which is Ken Kratz, he's now a criminal defense attorney, by the way, and he's responding <laughs> to someone on the subreddit, a Redditor that had emailed him at his office and said, What's good? what do you think about it? And he sent this thing, he calls it a quote-unquote defense documentary, defense documentary. He talks about purposely not to tell the audience about the DNA under the hood, et cetera, et cetera. And you can find this on the internet. Okay, December 25th. Then two days later, a second email goes out. It's, a, it's a, a more part of the conversation where he actually goes through here and he lists nine items. Okay, examples to consider from Ken Kratz. Uh, six, seven, eight, nine. And one of the ones I want you to take a look at here is number seven. Uh, phone records show three calls from Avery to Teresa's uh, cell phone on October 31st. And just take a look at the language there. Take a look at some of the punctuation you see, okay? Then, two days after this email, so this is the only first mentions you're seeing, there is an article, it's the first news article you'll find, and it's in People Magazine on their online version. And this is December 29th. And what it is, is an email interview with Ken Kratz, and he also says that he followed up by phone. But if you look at the language from December 29th, it's the precise language. The only change I've found is they changed the, the Arabic numeral three on three calls and they spell it out in this case. In every other instance, the punctuation is the same. Okay? So what's happening here is he's forwarded this exact same email that we saw before okay, to People Magazine as his interview. And he followed it up with a short phone call. And we just, when the punctuation is the same, we're talking about copy and paste, okay? We're talking about M dashes, we're talking about ellipsis, we're talking about all of these things, okay? And if you look at the whole people article, this is just an excerpt, it's the same thing through and through. It's copy and paste from these nine items, okay? Then you see a few days later, there's another Ken Kratz quote unquote interview in the New York Times, same thing, same language, same copy and paste. Okay, then you start to see some of these other articles come up. Uh, Breitbart.com, Netflix is making a murderer is a moral crime against Teresa Halbach's family. Okay, guess what you see cited in that article? You see this same Ken Kratz email that's getting forwarded to everyone. Then you have maybe a publication with a different ideology. The New Yorker publishes an article, Dead Certainty, How Making a Murderer Goes Wrong. And I'll tell you, we could have a whole hour just talking about the New Yorker piece, but we don't have time today. So what is my evaluation? I'll tell you that, in my opinion, some, some of the omissions alleged actually move the needle toward Avery's guilt, in my mind. Okay? But I'll tell you there are four other categories you could sort some of these other things in. They were successfully rebutted by defense counsel at trial. Okay? 
Some were not material to the murder case. I'm sure you can think of some of those you've seen. Some were completely unsubstantiated. They could have just been totally made up. And then some are very, very dubious allegations, perhaps something that we could even disprove. And the problem I have with the media reaction, with the copy and paste from the Kratz emails, see this, this asterisk at the bottom. Most articles place all quote unquote omissions into the first category, okay? These are things the filmmakers did not want you to know because they want you to think he's innocent, just like we saw on that Facebook response. Okay, so let's look at an example. I said there's some that are dubious. Let's look at an example of just one of them. I said we were going to talk about sweat DNA a little bit, okay? Now, this alleged so-called sweat DNA is mentioned in a lot of these articles, okay? So you can just look at the first one. How, this is a quote. How did DNA get under the hood if Avery never touched the car? Do the cops had a vial of Avery's sweat? Okay. He's saying, oh, well, we know they had his blood. We also know they had a saliva swab, but come on. Did they have a vial of his sweat? Because we found sweat DNA. All of these things. The New Yorker says the mysterious key to Hallback's car had sweat on it. You can place all of these things very easily, but you cannot plant sweat. Okay, what's the problem with sweat DNA? Okay, sweat DNA does not exist. Okay, <laughs> DNA, sweat does not have DNA. What sweat can do is transfer DNA from skin cells to an object through what's called a touch transfer. Okay, but sweat itself, so the cops wouldn't have to have a vial of Avery sweat. In fact, if they did have a vial of Avery sweat, it would do no good to them in planting evidence if it was if that was their intent. Okay, what's what why where am I getting this? Okay, a law professor, evidence prof blog from South Carolina School of Law actually has evaluated this. He took the defense attorney's claim this sweat DNA is a bunch of junk. Is he right? And the answer is yes. It's well established that sweat contains no DNA. Okay? And I'll tell you this. Avery's talking about, well, do the police have a vial of, uh, I mean, Kratz is talking about, do the police have a vial of Avery's sweat? Rhetorical question, you know, wanting you to say, of course not. Ken Kratz knows that sweat does not have DNA. And we know this because if you look at the trial transcripts, he's very careful to talk about skin cells possibly being transferred through sweat, not sweat DNA. Okay? He knows that he's not telling the truth here, but he, all of these media outlets are just reporting the lie, okay? So what is the filmmaker's response to these alleged omissions, okay? It's very simple. They say, of course we left stuff out. We only had 10 hours, so we did the best we could based on what we thought was the most relevant to the case, the most important stuff, okay? And how did they decide? We took our cues from the prosecution what they thought was the most compelling evidence. That's what we included, okay? Now, how do we test whether any of this is true? What did the prosecution think was important at trial? Well, I would imagine a really good place to look is the closing arguments by the prosecution at trial. What did they think was important? Well, fortunately, you can go to stephenaverycase.org and people have crowdsourced a bunch of money, and they've ordered all the transcripts, and they're all available online. You can read all the transcripts of all 27 uh, days of the trial, including all of these other things. And I would tell everyone to go look at this. And I want to give you an example. Let's stay on sweat DNA, which was not included in the program. So if you look at the prosecution's closing argument, it contains approximately 166 pages of transcript. The DNA on her hood is mentioned on a combined total of one page, okay? And part of that is Kratz rebutting the defense argument that it could have just been transferred by the splatter expert who was digging through the inside of the car and then went around and opened the hood, okay? So I think this actually adds up in line with the filmmaker's response that, well, he didn't think it was that important at trial. Now he's bringing it up. Of course, we had to admit some things. This is one of the things we admitted because the prosecution didn't seem to think it's very important. Okay. You can do this on your own with all of these alleged omissions. Okay. So the question I want to raise, if this is really an instance of Ken Kratz 
going out, trying to undermine the credibility of this series, what are his motivations in doing so? Okay, I think, you know, one obvious thought is, well, he cares about the truth, right? That's what prosecutors do. Most of them are very good, by the way. I don't think he's very good. Now, for someone who cares about the truth, I want you to compare these two statements made approximately one and a half months apart. The first is from the Avery closing. Ken Kratt says, defense argued there was no blood found in the trailer. Well, since Teresa wasn't killed in the trailer, there shouldn't be. Okay? A month and a half later, and he was present at trial sitting at counsel table next to Tom uh, Fallon. Tom Fallon says, describing Avery, they go back to the bedroom. Stephen A. Avery stabs her in the stomach. He hands the knife to Brendan Dassey, says, here, cut her. He assists. He helps kill her. He rapes her. He cuts her throat. This is what they're saying happened in the trailer. Okay? No blood in the trailer versus the trailer is a bloodbath. Okay? This is not someone who is totally wrapped up in telling, finding the truth about what happened. I don't think that's his motivation. Okay, is his motivation to protect his reputation? As it tells you at the end, in 2014, he lost his law license. He has destroyed his reputation in the community. He's no longer a prosecutor. He's a defense attorney, which was a very good thing. But this is not someone who has a reputation here that he's trying to defend as, it's, as if it's never been besmirched. Okay, I want to raise a possibility of a third in actually truer motivation. A letter just came out a few days ago, written from Ken Kratz to Stephen Avery at Stephen Avery's jail cell, okay, released by Stephen Avery's attorney. This was dated before the series came out, September 6th. Okay? Here's the letter on the left. You can't see the whole thing. You can look it up. You can find it anywhere. But I've got some excerpts. Okay, This is what Kratz is telling Avery. I got your letter just dated August 28th wherein you tell me your visitor list is full. Now first, why do you tell someone that your visitor list is full? Because they're asking to come visit you, okay? And look what's happening. Stephen Avery is telling him, hey, will you please look at the fingerprints on the car? They might show who set me up. He's writing crap saying, hey, can you help me out here? What, what goes on in the letter? Kratz says, I apologize for misunderstanding your letters from a couple years ago. They've been corresponding for years, okay? As I thought you were interested in being honest about what happened and finally telling the whole story to someone. Since I'm the person who probably knows about more about your case than anyone else, I hoped that you would choose me to tell your story to. Why does he so care about Stephen Avery telling him his story? Then he shames him. The difference between you and the famous murderers is they actually came clean. Okay? And he says, I was willing to do that for you. Look right above. Write a book. If you change your mind and want to tell me your story someday, please contact me. Okay? What is happening here is that Ken Kratz wants to write Stephen Avery's confession book and make a bunch of money doing so. Okay? And that's not going to work so well if everybody in town thinks that Stephen Avery is actually innocent. So you discredit the film, leave him hopeless, he'll finally confess because he'll probably get, or maybe his family will get some of the money too, Ken Kratz will write the book, help him out, really help himself out. Okay, here's one of the problems I have, well that's his motivations, I think. But what are some of the broader assumptions about the criticisms of the show? I think there's an ideological assumption going on, and it's this, that if we can know or convince ourselves that Stephen Avery is guilty, then the actions portrayed in the series should not cause us any concern. Okay? And this goes exactly to what Professor Pearl was talking about. These are things we don't want to believe. And if Avery actually murdered her, then the system worked irrespective of the process. I think this is an assumption behind the criticism. Because the criticism is always about, well, you shouldn't pay any attention to making a murderer because we know he's guilty. Okay? Now, I think Kratz buys into this same assumption. 
Because if they're guilty, it doesn't matter. The process, how it played out, is irrelevant. So I think this gives rise to a couple of important questions. One, if we knew with absolute certainty that he murdered her, does that undercut the value and integrity of making a murder? Now, I asked my students this very question yesterday, and a lot of them said, no, I don't think that totally devalues or undercuts the series. I think it still has a lot of value in that it shows a process that perhaps has problems. Second, can we always say the system worked when the person convicted is the actual perpetrator of the crime? This kind of asks, can the ends justify the means when the ends are, are correct or noble or true? And I think the answer is no. And I think there's different ways of thinking about it. So Blackstone, for example, would say no. That is not correct. It's better that we let some guilty people go in order to protect the process, because we have to protect the process to protect the innocent. Okay? There's actually a very good article by one of our own professors here, Arnold Lowy, 1983, where he talked about the Fourth Amendment, its real purpose is to protect the innocent. We have to protect the rights of the guilty in order to preserve those same rights for all the innocent. It's a very good article, and I would recommend it to everyone. And I want to talk about another source. This is right at the end here um, that f shifts the focus to the actual guilty themselves. And this is a very strong quote, perhaps controversial. And I want you to think about it. And I want you to think about this book. It's called The New Jim Crow. And I'm, I'm sure some people have heard of it by Michelle Alexander. And I would recommend it to everyone. It talks about the, the types of suffering and discrimination that people who've actually guilty have committed crimes and are convicted felons, what they experience. Now, this book deals with issues of race and mass incarceration, which aren't necessarily present in Making a Murderer. But there's some very, very powerful ideas in this book. Now, earlier I said, showed you that President Obama had responded to the petition. And the response was, well, I don't have the power to pardon. Okay? Well, there was another person that the petition was addressed to, the person who actually has the power, the governor of Wisconsin, Scott Walker. Okay, what does he say? Viewers of the Netflix series on Stephen Avery should read the unanimous opinion of the Court of Appeals before jumping to conclusions. Right? We're all stupid. We just need to go read what the court did. And I want to put up one last slide, and I want to remind everyone in this room that when Stephen Avery was convicted of rape, in 1987, the same Court of Appeals affirmed unanimously. In fact, it was the same chief judge about a decade earlier. So I want everybody to think about some of these things. And thank you very much. Thanks, Brandon. Oh, OK. Uh,